So uh, before I start, I keep wanting to make this announcement and keep forgetting to do it. So um, I'll start with the announcement today. And that is, if you enjoy the metabolic melodies, uh, which I hope that you do, um, and you actually want to hear somebody sing them with musical talent, um, the a cappella group known as Divine, uh, are there any Divine members in here? Don't see any, okay. Um, we'll be performing metabolic melodies in concert um, on Tuesday, November 1st at 7 p.m. in LaSalle Stewart Center Construction and Engineering Hall. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. It'll actually sound a heck of a lot better than you guys have heard them from me. And I hope that you can come and enjoy that. And I'll announce that again on Monday. But um, very excited about that. Hope that all, that all plays out. Monday at 7, LaSalle Stewart. Oh, I'm sorry, Tuesday, not Monday. Tuesday at 7 at LaSalle Stewart. It's November, November the 1st. Okay. Um, last time you heard a lecture where you probably heard a lot of things that you hadn't heard before. And uh, that was kind of dense, right? I'll be the first to say that was pretty dense. Um, I haven't written the highlights for that. I'll get the highlights done shortly. Somebody told me there was a problem with a link with the video from that lecture. I will fix that. I think I know what I did with it, so I apologize. I'll get that fixed um, uh, shortly. Um, but today's lecture, after I finish the uh, things with the uh, blood clotting, will be things that likely you have heard on many occasions before, particularly in organic chemistry. So a lot of what will be in today's lecture, I think, will be review for you. And one of the things I'll encourage you to be thinking about in today's lecture uh, are learning a lot of the terminology. Okay? This will be the first lecture where I will actually ask you to memorize some structures. Uh, and I'll tell you about those as we get into those. Before I do that, though, I need to finish up talking about the considerations that we had for blood clotting. So vitamin K, I uh, pointed out to you, was important um, as a factor for um, the carboxylation of glutamate residues on several proteins. Okay? And so this is sort of summarized on the screen. Um, vitamin K, in addition to its role uh, with respect to blood clotting, also plays in some important functions in bone development. Um, and I've summarized some of these here. So like it does in blood clotting, uh, in bone development, uh, vitamin K stimulates carboxylation of glutamate side chains on a variety uh, of proteins, and that helps to activate those. Some of those include osteocalcin, uh, which binds the bone matrix, and that helps to uh, stimulate the um, uh, uh, development of bone cells, bone-making cells, osteoblasts. And the um, periostin, uh, which is involved in the cell migration, bone development, and so forth. So again. Um, important roles there. One of the things to think about with bones, I don't get a chance to talk about it too much in this class, but we think of bones as structural components, which of course they are. But in the body, bones really play two important functions. One function, of course, being structural support. Uh, the other function being that bones really are a reservoir of calcium. A lot of people don't realize it, but their bones, your bones are constantly being made and broken down. The body dumps calcium into bones when it needs to store it, and the body takes calcium out of bones when it needs it. And so that process of building and tearing down bones is happening all the time. Well, I mentioned that um, the um, uh, warfarin was a, 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 what we call a blood thinning agent, although there's not making it any thinner, we're just making it less likely to clot. Another uh, uh, compound commonly described as a blood thinner is aspirin. And aspirin works in a very different way than warfarin does. So I just want to briefly mention that. I will talk actually later, uh, I think it's next term, uh, about uh, how aspirin actually works, but I'll just briefly introduce the topic today. Some people take aspirin uh, be, uh, to help uh, reduce the incidence of clotting, just for the same reason people take warfarin uh, to reduce uh, the incidence of clotting there. Aspirin has the advantage, of course, that it's a non-prescription uh, medication. And uh, you take it in small enough doses that it's really not a problem in terms of hemorrhaging or something like that. Even if you're taking aspirin, uh, if you're going to have surgery or something, the doctor will say, you know, please stop taking aspirin a few days before the surgery so you have the proper clotting that you need for a uh, healing process. The uh, aspirin is uh, a compound that works by inhibiting the production of prostaglandins. And I briefly mentioned that in the class earlier when I said some people have a stomach sensitivity to aspirin. And um, prostaglandins, as we will see next term, are compounds that are involved in a wide variety of really 
odd functions, some of them contradictory in nature. And one of those functions for uh, aspirin is that because uh, a compound known as thromboxane A2, which is what helps to make platelets sticky, comes from prostaglandins, if you, s if you inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandins, you inhibit the production of thromboxane A2, and therefore you make the platelets less sticky. Okay? So that's actually how aspirin works. So prostaglandins are precursors of that compound. And thromboxanes are involved in that platelet stickiness phenomenon. Okay. Now, um, the last thing I want to talk about with respect to blood clotting is blood unclotting. So um, we think of the clotting process uh, because we get very visible um, scabs and so forth when we cut ourselves. And we don't really think about the fact that once I get a scab, it's not there for the rest of my life. There's actually a healing process that goes on. And that means that the body also, in addition to making clots, has to have a way of breaking them down. And so that breaking down process is what I want to briefly show you here. The breaking down is actually accomplished by a protein called plasmin, P-L-A-S-M-I-N. This scheme, which looks a little hairy, and I'm going to, I'm going to simplify it for you, this scheme is showing the activation of plasmin from a zymogen known as plasminogen. So again, these are very, very powerful enzymes. We don't want to have them willy-nilly active because, for example, we wouldn't want to have plasmin breaking down a clot as the rest of the body was trying to make a clot. All right? So plasmin is very tightly regulated, very tightly controlled. And we can see that there's some things that contribute to the activation or the inhibition of action of plasmin. So, first of all, plasminogen itself is inactive because that's a zymogen form. The activation of plasmin is favored by those uh, enzymes that you see on the screen with the blue arrows. All of those blue arrow enzymes or factors help to activate plasminogen to become the active form plasmin. Now, you'll notice that factor 11A and factor 12A were things that were part of the blood clotting scheme. So again, we see some complexity to this uh, regulation because some things are favoring clotting and or favoring breakdown. You can imagine this would be tightly enough regulated that 11 and 12, factor 11 and 12, for example, would not be active as, uh, on plasmin as a, uh, on plasminogen as a clot is being made. But we won't go into the details of that. The factor that I want you to focus on with respect to the activation of plasminogen is called tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA. TPA is a serine protease. The story's getting old, right? This is serine protease, converts plasminogen into, pl into plasmin. And TPA has the distinction is that it was the first genetically engineered protein to be used in human beings. And it was used because TPA has the ability to favor the breakdown of clots where necessary. So for example, people who have a blood clot in their heart, if it is, or if for that matter, in their brain, if it is recognized on a scan of the patient and it can be caught early enough, TPA can be administered to the area of that clot and favor the activation of plasmin and the breakdown of the clot. It's remarkable how efficiently this process works. Now, as you might imagine, plasmin is a very powerful enzyme. We don't want plasmin willy-nilly active because, again, we don't want to be stopping the clotting of little bitty things that we don't uh, normally think about. We don't want to favor hemorrhaging, for example. But in very specific cases, TPA is administered to patients and has been a lifesaver for many of them. It also can help people immediately after they've had a stroke, certain types of stroke, uh, to um, prevent some of the uh, severe side effects that can happen with that. Yes? The TPA is absolutely produced in the human body. So it's a natural, normal enzyme produced by the body. Okay? So TPA is normally produced by the body, but it's not produced, let's say, once you've got a clot in your heart okay, that shouldn't be there. It may not be, it's probably not being produced at that site and for that purpose. right? So the physician might administer that at that point to favor the, the breakup of that clot. 
Okay. Um, there are some inhibitors of plasmin. And so once you've activated a zymogen, it's pretty hard to inactivate it by doing anything except breaking it down by a protease. But some of the activated zymogens do, in fact, have specific inhibitors. We saw, for example, that alpha-1 antitrypsin was an inhibitor of trypsin and of elastase, right? We can't reverse the activation. Okay? So these inhibitors can play important roles in helping to balance the proper amount of plasmin, in this case, uh, that is active. So we see uh, the alpha-2 antiplasmin there, the alpha-2 uh, macroglobulin, with the red arrows indicating that they're inhibiting the action of plasmin. Okay, well, that's as much as I want to say about that slide. Right, tissue plasminogen activator, and there's plasmin. And plasmin, as I said, is also a serine protease. Plasmin's action is to cleave the fibrin clots. It's very specific for cleaving fibr fibrin clots and these other blood-related um, compounds, as well as other compounds in the cell like laminin. You'll notice that the von Willebrandt factor is also a target for plasmin. And so when you break down the von Willebrandt factor, if you do it the right way, then what happens is you favor the degradation of factor eight. In fact, since factor eight is needed for that amplification phase, then there's going to be no amplification. You're not going to favor blood clotting. Um, Plasmin also activates collagenases. Any thoughts about why that might be important? What, 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 do, what would a collagenase do? What is collagen? So collagen is a part of your connective tissue. It's the glue that sticks you together. So a collagenase would Break down collagen. And why might breakdown of collagen be important for plasmin? What are we hoping to favor in the process after we've made a blood clot? Are there any pre-meds in here? What are you after, pre-meds? Aren't you after healing? Oh, yeah. So you've had damage to tissue that has exposed collagen, right? And that was the signal for the blood clotting factors to be activated. In the healing process, aren't you going to want to remove the visibility of that collagen so that it's not continuing to stimulate that clotting process? Activation of collagenases by plasmin is very important for that purpose. So it's a part of the healing process. Okay. That was last time. We won't do the metabolic melody again. Oh, we have one later. We'll have one later. OK. Now, um, any questions about that before I jump into our next topic? OK, well, like I said, I think that what I'll be talking about here today will largely be um, review for you. Carbohydrates. So carbohydrate. The name literally tells you the structure of the compounds. Carbo meaning carbon, hydrate meaning water. So carbohydrates are hydrated forms of carbon. That's what they are. So today I'm going to talk about nomenclature, I'm going to talk about structures, I'm going to talk about how the sugars, carbohydrates, cyclize, and then I'll talk about some modifications of them. Okay? When we talk about carbohydrates, we hear the word saccharide, monosaccharide, polysaccharide, etc. Saccharide comes from, I think, the Greek, I think, uh, and it means sweet taste. So these are the sugar compounds, okay, among other things. And what I'm going to talk about here specifically are the monosaccharides. So when I talk about a monosaccharide, I'm talking about something that has a single sugar unit we'll see that there are disaccharides, which means that they have two sugar units attached to each other. We have trisaccharides, oligosaccharides, and polysaccharides, depending upon how many sugars are joined together. The most common carbohydrates are the monosaccharides. Now, I said that carbohydrates were hydrates of carbon. If we look at the general structure of simple carbohydrates, we see that CxH2OX, 
That's the general formula. Carbon, hydrate. H2O, of course, being water. When we look at specific examples, we see how that plays out. C6, H12, O6, right? We see that many carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, have exactly the same formula. Fructose and glucose are both C6, H12, O6. Galactose, C6, H12, O6. But in each case, we can see in these simple carbohydrates that we have twice as many hydrogens as we have either oxygens or carbons. Okay? Oh, question, yeah. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. So it is H2O, and then the whole H2O is X. So that's why the, whatever is the X gets multiplied twice by the, by the number of hydrogens. Yep. Okay. Um, so X, if X is equal to 3, we talk about um, a uh, triose. And by the way, we use the word O, um, the, the suffix O-S-E, at the end of a name to indicate a sugar slash carbohydrate. And we'll see there's a lot of iterations of those names. So if X is 3, we're talking about a triose. So glyceraldehyde that's shown on the screen is C3H6O3 is a triose. If X is 4, we have a tetrose. And trioses and tetroses are not very common, by the way. The most common carbohydrates are actually the pentoses and the hexoses. Pentose meaning that X is equal to 5, or hexoses meaning that X is equal to 6. There are a few sugars in the body that have, uh, the, uh, have seven carbons. They're known as heptoses. And um, rare one, uh, an octose containing eight carbons. OK. We also have chemical distinction of the different kinds of sugars, as I'll show you in just a bit. And the distinctions are that if they contain an aldehyde group, they are known as aldoses. And if they contain a ketone group, they're known as ketoses. So I could say, for example, that glyceraldehyde, which has three carbons, is an aldotriose. And if you were to call it a trialdose, I wouldn't care. So I don't care what order you put those in. The, the actual correct name is an aldotriose. But for our purposes, we're simply just understanding the basics by which these names are used. Well, this shows the structure um, of some of the simple sugars, uh, some of which you saw on the last slide. Glyceraldehyde is shown on the left having three carbons. And you can see that aldehyde group at the top. D3-ose uh, contains four carbons. And you see it is also uh, an aldose. D-ribose and D-glucose. So these are all aldoses, three carbons, of course, being a triose, four carbons being a tetrose, five carbons being a pentose, and six carbons being a hexose. OK. Um, the nature of an aldose versus a ketose is shown in this slide. We can see, again, the structure of glucose. And by the way, what I'm showing you, I'm sure you can um, Recall from your organic chemistry, I'm showing you what's called the straight chain form. That is, this is a sugar that has not cyclized, and we'll talk about how sugars do cyclize in a bit. And we see a ketose, meaning it has a ketone. And so instead of having that aldehyde at the very top carbon, as we see in glucose, fructose has the carbonyl group at position number two, which is a ketone, not an aldehyde. And you may remember from organic chemistry that aldehydes are more easily oxidized than ketones are. And so you might expect that glucose would be chemically more stable. Uh, that, that, I'm sorry, that fructose would be more chemically stable than glucose, and you would be correct. Okay. Now I want to point out something of these two. This is, these are two sugars that you're going to memorize the structure of. So I'm going to try to make this as simple for you as I can. Look at ketose and glucose. These carbons have stereoisomeric forms because, I'm sorry, these sugars have stereoisomeric forms because they have carbons that each have four different things attached to them. That's why we write the OH on the left or the right, because we change the chemical nature of it depending upon which side of the carbon the hydroxide is on. If we look at the orientation of hydroxides starting at, and by the way, when we number these, we start at the top with carbon number one. So the aldehyde of glucose is carbon number one, two, three, four, five, six, going down. If we look at carbons four through six for these two sugars, they have exactly the same configuration. 
and I think of it as left, right, right. They both have left, right, right. These two sugars only differ in that fructose is a ketone, meaning it has a carbonyl at position two, and glucose is an aldehyde, meaning it has a, carbon, uh, a carbonyl at position number one. All right? So these two structures are identical. Okay? Aldose versus ketose. Now, um, if we look at straight chain forms of some sugars here, we see the most common sugars that we're going to talk about in this class. D-ribose, for example, is an aldopentose. I hope you would recognize that. And an aldopentose means it has an aldehyde at position number one. And it has five carbons, meaning it is um, a pentose. Glucose, name that for me, please. Aldohexose, OK. And how about fructose, defructose? I hear different things. Keto, hexo, uh, keto, I put pentose. Goodness, I got my thing wrong. It's keto hexose, guys. Yeah, I got my own, I got my own one wrong. This is embarrassing. All right, it's a keto hexose. We should just change it on the screen while we're here. Wouldn't that be cool? Do it because you can. All right, we're going to call it a keto H-E-X-O-S-E. Oh, hexosose. <laughs> I should never do something on the fly. <laughs> I get in trouble every time I do something like that. All right. Now all the people out in TV land say, oh, it's fixed right there. All right. So we have that. We have a ketohexose. All right. An aldohexose. And what's manos? Aldohexose again, right? OK. Now, of these ones I show on the screen, you're going to memorize the structure of four of them right there. And I don't do that to make it, oh, I'm going to give you something to do. That's not my purpose in making you memorize anything. The reason I make you memorize these is you're going to need to know them in other classes you're going to take. So you might as well learn them here. It'll be easier learning them the next time. For each of these sugars, you're going to learn their structure in both the straight chain form and in the, uh, the cyclic form that I'll show you in a bit. Okay? And they're not difficult. You learn that fructose and glucose have the same configuration carbons 4 through 6. If you compare carbons 4 through 6 for galactose compared to glucose, for example, there's only one difference there, and that's at carbon number 4. You can see that the OH is on the left for uh, the galactose and on the right for the glucose. Ribose is very easy to memorize. All the hydroxyls are on the right side. Ribose, of course, is the sugar that's found in ribonucleotides. And that's why we talk about it and why it is, of course, very important. OK. Well, I've been talking about asymmetric carbons. So let's uh, refresh our memories about what it means to have asymmetric carbons. Asymmetric carbons, of course, arise when a carbon is attached to four different chemical groups. We talked about that with respect to the amino acids and how we had L amino acids uh, present in proteins that are made on the face of the Earth. Sugars are primarily what we call D, although we see L sugars appearing in various things, l fucose being a very common one. But in this case, I need to introduce you to not only the fact that we have asymmetric carbons, but also how we name them with respect to their structure. And you're going to like this because this is very simple. Okay? There's the penultimate, meaning the next to last carbon. So if we line this up going down, the orientation of the penultimate carbon will tell you if it's a D or an L. Okay? The L configuration, left, puts hydroxyl on the left. The D configuration puts the hydroxyl on the right, dextrorotary. Okay? These are mirror images. These two happen to be mirror images of each other. Okay? L glyceraldehyde versus D glyceraldehyde. Okay? All right. Um, now, one thing I want to caution you about. L and D does not happen for a given named sugar, okay, only by changing the penultimate carbon. I'll show you an example in a second. So if I, for example, have, oh, actually, it's not on this one, but it's on the next one, um, D-glucose. You can see it's a D because you look at that next to last carbon on the bottom, and you see that hydroxyl on the right side, right? So it's a D sugar, right? You see that this guy has four asymmetric carbons. The last one only had one asymmetric carbons. 
one isometric carbon. So that means we have two to the fourth power possible isomers of this, this particular sugar. Two to the fourth is 16, right? Okay, so we have 16 different aldohexoses that we could have. Okay, there's the D. Now, here's what I was talking about uh, prematurely just a second ago, and that is this. Notice that you say, okay, well look, the, the hydroxyl's on the left, that's an L sugar, but the rest of the structure of L glucose is the mirror image of D glucose. Remember that. So if I say, draw the structure of L-fructose, you would say, well, Ahern didn't make us memorize L-fructose, but I do know the structure of D-fructose, which he did make us memorize, so if I take the mirror image of that, I will have L-fructose. Okay. Don't forget that the L form of a named sugar is the mirror image of the same sugar. Right? Don't forget that. Now, when we, we have a name that we give to those. So mirror, uh, sugars that are mirror images of each other are called enantiomers. That's a term that you need to know, enantiomers. Okay. So L-glucose and D-glucose are enantiomers of each other. Okay. There's the D, there's the L. But notice it wasn't just the configuration of the bottom hydroxyl that made that be L-glucose. It was the fact that it was a mirror image that made it the L-glucose. Okay, well, what if we have things that are not mirror images, but they differ in configuration? Here's a good example, D-glucose on the left, D-gulose on the right, all right? Some of these carbons are the same configuration. Some of these carbons have different configurations. You would look at the overall sugar and you would say, well, they are not mirror images of each other, just that little part is a mirror image. So D-glucose is not the mirror image of D-gulose. So when I have two sugars that are the same chemical type, that is in this case they're both aldoses, and that have the same number of carbons, these guys both have six, but that differ in configuration they're called diastereomers. Diastereomers. Okay. The biggest configuration we can have, the biggest grouping we can have, are stereoisomers. Right? Simply meaning that they have different, different structures. The subgroup of that would be diastereomers. They have the same chemical configuration, same number of carbons, but they're not mirror images. Another, configure, another uh, subset of stereoisomers would be enantiomers. They have the exact same structure except they're mirror images of each other. Okay? Okay. Another term. Two sugars that differ in the configuration of only one carbon are known as epimers. Glucose and galactose, D-glucose, D-galactose, are epimers of each other. They only differ in the configuration of the carbon that I've got the green box around. Okay? That's the only difference between them. So those two are epimers. Right? So epimers are a subset of the diastereomers. Okay. Well, this uh, figure shows something important, and that is how sugars can cyclize. So if we look at this uh, in the straight chain form, in, in, in organic chemistry you get all those little models you get to play with and bend all those bonds, and when you do that, you'll learn that it's possible to turn these, rotate these things around so that some of these carbons are relatively close to each other. It turns out that if you have a structure like a sugar like this one, that carbons number four and five can be brought into close proximity of carbon number one quite readily. And when that happens, you make a ringed structure. Now, I'll show you in a second how that actually happens. Okay? But that ring structure is designated in a variety of ways. This is one way. I'm not fond of this way, but this is one way that that ringed structure is actually designated. Okay? This is kind of a lazy shortcut way that I don't think shows you the structure very well. Okay? In the process of making that ring, 
a new asymmetric carbon was created. Notice the carbon on the left is only bound to three things, an oxygen, a hydrogen, and then the rest of the carbon chain. The molecule on the right, the carbon, is bound to the lower part of the chain. It's bound to a hydroxyl, it's bound to a hydrogen, and it's bound to the upper part of the chain. That carbon is now asymmetric, whereas the other one wasn't. So the ringed form of glucose has an extra asymmetric carbon, and that new asymmetric carbon has a name. It's called anomeric. Anomeric carbon will always be the carbon that was the carbonyl carbon. The anomeric carbon will always be the carbon that was the anomeric carbon. Two sugars that have identical structure, well, I should be back up, I'm getting ahead of myself. If I have an anomeric carbon, that means that the hydroxyl that's attached to it can be in two different configurations, just like the other asymmetric carbons have. two different configurations. So we'll see that in just a second. Let's watch the cyclization process, all right? So here uh, is shown the straight chain form of glucose. And here we can see the cyclization happening. Carbon number five with its hydroxyl is coming very close to carbon number one. And we see the formation of the ring structure here, okay? And we can watch it again, <laughs> instant replay, okay? Okay, so there's the ring structure. And this is actually the ring structure form I like to draw things as because I think it helps to show things better. We can see fructose going through the same process here. But when we look at fructose, remember that carbonyl group is on carbon number two, not carbon number one. So in the case of fructose, we've got a couple possibilities for how this ring structure can form. Carbon number two can get close to carbon number five or carbon number six instead of carbon number uh, four or five, as we saw with glucose, which had carbon number one, right? When we see this, we see that there's two different stereoisomers of fructose that are made. One form has a five-membered ring. And by the way, five-membered ring doesn't mean five carbons, guys. There's six carbons in there. The other form is a six-membered ring. I'm only going to make you memorize the five-membered ring. You're not going to have to memorize the six-membered ring, OK? For, for fructose, that is, OK? Only the five-membered ring. The five-membered ring is called a furanose, F-U-R-A-N-O-S-E, F for five. The six-membered ring is called a pyranose, P-Y-R-A-N-O-S-E. Now you look at the way this is drawn and you see the new asymmetric carbon with the new hydroxyl on it, and that's shown on the right side of each of those molecules with the oxygen in sort of a orangish brown and the hydrogen in a red, okay? I don't know why the one on the bottom is blue, but it is, all right. In either case, what happens is the, that hydroxyl can be in two configurations. You see it in this case in the down configuration and if it's in the down configuration, we say it's in, in the alpha form. So this is called alpha D, fructopyranose on the bottom, or alpha D fructofuranose on the top. If the hydroxyl is in the upward position, then that would mean that the CH2OH would be on the bottom, right? Then we say that that's in the beta configuration. So we can see that here for glucose. Glucose, it's easier to see. Alpha D glucopyranose on the left with the hydroxyl down, beta D glucopyranose with the hydroxyl up on the right. Notice these are pyranoses because they have six membered rings. Okay. Notice in each case, whether it is fructose or it's glucose, as I have on the screen here, that it's a six membered ring. But oxygen is one of the members of the ring, right? In this case, we have an extra carbon that doesn't fit in the ring, and it's the very last carbon that's sticking up in the back. If we go back and we look at the previous slide with respect to the, furino, to the fructose, we see that there's two carbons sticking off of there. 
Carbon number one is above, as drawn here. And carbon number six, on the left side, is also above, as drawn here. You might say, well, what would an L sugar look like? An L sugar would look like that last carbon is down instead of up. Okay. Okay. Down versus up. So down indicating alpha, up meaning beta. And it's the hydroxyl that indicates that, right? So notice on the previous slide, it was the hydroxyl down that indicated it was an alpha. It wasn't the CH2OH that indicated it was an alpha. It was the hydroxyl being down that indicated that. If the hydroxyl were up and the CH2OH were down, that would be in the beta form. OK. Um, two, ano uh, I'm sorry, two sugars that differ only in the configuration of their anomeric carbon are called anomers. Yes, Casey. That's correct. So the anomeric carbon is always the carbon that was in the carbonyl group, right? So in the case of glucose, that carbonyl was on carbon number one. So that's why we see on carbon number one here that the alpha, that in this case, the alpha or beta is determined by the, the configuration around that carbon. How do I know which one was in the carbonyl group? Well, the one that was in the carbonyl group will always, in the way we draw these, be the one linked to the oxygen on the right side. So you say, okay, that was the one, that must have been the carbon that was linked to the um, company L group. Okay, so a lot of nomenclature there. Um, there is beta D fructofuranose. There is beta D ribofuranose. It's ribose now you're seeing in the ring form. Ribose turns out to be really easy. Remember, when we drew it in the straight chain, all the hydroxyls were on the right. When we draw it in the ring structure, we only have two we have to worry about. And they're both down. We can have either alpha or beta. Beta is the most common form of ribose because that's the form found in ribonucleotides. OK. Uh, there's a variety of ways of drawing those rings. I'm also not very fond of this, although a lot of people are. But I draw it here uh, to show you something very important about these sugars. And that is that this is the same sugar on the left and the right. Okay? This is actually beta D glucose, both of these. And the only difference between these two beta D glucose is how we rotated those single bonds. Okay? There's no difference in, chemical in, in the chemical uh, composition of this thing. They're both the same. But because of the ways that we've rotated those angles of the single bonds, we can either make this into something that looks like a chair form on the left or a boat form as shown on the right. Now, we've learned a fair amount about steric hindrance in this class. And we learned that steric hindrance is a consideration for stability of molecules. Both of these forms exist. Which one do you suppose predominates? Chair. And chair predominates because we see that there could be some interactions that might be unfavorable between the hydroxyls up above the ring. And that's exactly right. So chair predominates. There are some more ways of writing that ring structure. The one I like the very least is the one shown on the right. If you do much work in Wikipedia, you'll see that one all the time. And it's like, how in the world? Why would anybody write a structure like that? I don't know. That's, they're all the same structure. It's actually alpha D glucose on the right. But I will not expect you to do that. The only ring structure that I expect you will know will be the one on the second from the left. Okay? That's true for glucose. That's true for galactose, that's true for ribose, and that's true also for fructose. The fructose is the only one, the only hexose, that I expect you to know in the uh, furanose form, that is the five-membered ring. And that's because that's the predominant form of fructose, the five-membered ring. Okay? So you've seen two things in furanose form, fructose and what else? The sooner I get an answer, the sooner we get done with this lecture. Ribose, guys. Ribose. Right? I just showed it to you. Okay, people aren't very awake today. I'm not either. I can't complain. All right. Um, I've been showing you simple sugars. And simple sugars predominate. But sugars come in modified forms as well. We're going to see some of those as we get talking about 
uh, the process of glycolysis. And I show you some of these here. Top left, gal galactosamine. As its name suggests, it's derived from galactose. It has an amine group put onto it. And amines commonly are put onto carbon number two in modified sugars. And acetyl glucosamine, again, coming from glucose, we see the amine on the second sugar. And that amine has an acetyl group attached to it. Okay. Mannose 6-phosphate. Right. Commonly, we see phosphates attached at carbons number one or carbon number six. In this case, mannose 6-phosphate. Lower left, you see fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. We'll talk about that a lot later in the term with, with respect to glycolysis intermediate. And here we can see a phosphate put onto both carbon number six and carbon number one. Okay. We also see oxidation of sugars. Glucuronic acid that you can see here is a glucose that has had its CH2OH at position number six oxidized to a, carb to a carboxyl group. As you might expect, a, carb a carboxyl group will ionize. and That's going to be more polar than is glucose itself. Glucuronic acid is commonly used to make things soluble in bile. Okay? Making things soluble. It'll get attached to molecules. And that carboxyl group that's there will help make the, the molecule be sol soluble. I'm not asking you to memorize these structures. I'm just simply showing you some derivatives that are there. OK, let's turn our attention to what are called glycosides. Glycosides are modified sugars that have a specific kind of modification. So the last figure showed you a variety of modifications. But glycosides are modifications that affect the hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon. They affect the hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon. In this case, we can see that the anomeric carbon has a hydroxyl in the alpha position. And the hydrogen has been replaced by a methyl group. When you replace the hydrogen of an anomeric carbon, you do something to that sugar that prevents it from being able to become linear. Okay? You saw how that circular form came from the linear form in that movie that I showed you, that process can be reversed back and forth, back and forth. And in fact, in solution, that happens a lot. And what will stop that from happening is if you make a glycoside. Once you alter that hydroxyl on the anomeric carbon, it can no longer linearize. It's stuck in whatever configuration you have left it in. Very important point. It's stuck in that configuration. We'll talk more about glycosides when I talk about polysaccharides. Because as we start linking multiple, car multiple sugars together, they're usually linked through the anomeric carbon, which means that they are, therefore, glycosides. OK. Other modified carbohydrates that we see are called sugar alcohols. Sorbitol is an artificial sweetener. It's also called glucitol. And you can see it's exactly like glucose, except that at the very top, it's not an aldehyde. The aldehyde has been reduced to an alcohol. This guy tastes sweet because it looks to your taste buds like it's glucose. But your body doesn't break it down like it breaks down glucose. Very few calories arise as a result of this. And so for this reason, it's used as an artificial sweetener. A lot of people consider it to be a very safe artificial sweetener for that purpose. Other artificial sweeteners include sucralose. Now next time, we'll talk about disaccharides. This is the first one that you see. It is a a modified disaccharide. You can see it has two sugar units joined to each other, but it has something very odd. And the something very odd that it has is that it has a chloride attached in two places. On the right sugar, it's at carbon number one and at carbon number six. This also looks to your taste buds like it's sugar. This resembles sucrose, which is why it's called sucralose. Okay? And the taste buds say, oh, I, I found some. Well, the body can't break this down. When you can't break it down, you can't get calories out of it. And that's what happens here. So artificial sweeteners have that strategy. They fool the taste buds, but they can't be broken down, or they can be inefficiently broken down. OK. Disaccharides I'm going to talk more about next time. They include sucrose, lactose, maltose. You can see the two sugars that comprise each of those. And we'll talk about polysaccharides next time as well. And since I'm starting to talk about next time, you can probably guess what's next.
This is a real easy one to sing. I want to get everybody going on it, okay? It died on me. What did it do? Oh, oh, there we go. Carbohydrates all should sing. Glory to the Hayward ring. And oh carbons high when they're in a glycoside. Glucopyranose is there in the boat or in the chair. Alpha, beta, D, and L, diastereomer, hell. Alpha, beta, D, and L, diastereo. <laughs>